the topic is medical missionary work in the Bible. And the reason I named it this is because I believe that that we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians can show everything that we believe from the Bible. And I believe that we need to be able to show what we believe to those not of our faith from the Bible as well. And uh, we know that spirit of prophecy um, is a gift that God gave to our church. But those people who are non-believers, they don't understand the gift. We should give them books and encourage them to read, but they don't look at it the same way we do. They don't look at it as something divinely inspired because they're not familiar with it. So as we share, uh, we need to show them from the scriptures what we believe. And uh, as they become convicted and converted, uh, then the Holy Spirit will reveal to them the amazing gift of the spirit of prophecy. So I'm going to start this presentation uh, from scripture alone, and then we will be looking at plenty of, of uh, passages from the spirit of prophecy as well. So I'm going to go ahead and start with this uh, verse in the Bible. Uh, of course, Jesus gave the gospel commission, and we read about that in Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And then we read in Luke chapter 10, verse 8 and 9. And into whatsoever city ye enter, Jesus told them, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you, and heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. So here Jesus gave the commission, the gospel commission, to the 12 disciples, and then afterward the 70, and he told them basically the same thing, that they were to go out, they were to preach the gospel, and they were to cure diseases and heal the sick. Okay? So, hang on. Let me, there we go. All right, Matthew chapter 10, uh, verse 1, we read this. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness <clears throat> and all manner of disease. Pretty powerful, isn't it? Then, of course, in verse 7 and 8, the same thing as what we read in Luke. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. And then in Mark 16, and somehow I forgot to put the, uh, the verse there, but this is uh, in Mark chapter 16. And these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And, oh, by the way, I thought I would mention, you know, where the Bible says they shall lay hands on the sick, I believe that we should lay hands on the sick. We should place our hands upon them, and we should pray for them. But I believe that it also includes ministering to their physical needs by the use of natural remedies, I believe is included uh, in that laying hands on the sick. And uh, I've seen God recover people from excruciating pain by laying hands on them using hydrotherapy or water treatments. Pretty amazing. All right, so let's move on. And then in the book of John, Chapter 9, verse 5 to 7, we read about Jesus' use of the natural remedies found in nature. Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, hang on just a second here. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, go. Wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. So here we see that Jesus anointed this man, his eyes, with clay and spittle. So he picked up this clay and he spit in it. And then he put the clay on the man's eyes. And he told him to go and wash in the water of the pool of Siloam. And when he did that, he received his sight. 
pretty amazing. So Jesus used a very simple uh, natural remedy. We know it wasn't the clay that healed the blind man. We know it wasn't the clay. It was the power of God working through the clay and the water, but it was the power of God that brought the miracle of healing. So let's take a look in the Old Testament. We're going to read about medical missionary work in the Old Testament. And uh, we're going to look in the book of Isaiah, chapter 38. Isaiah 38, verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. So, you know, it's interesting that this sickness that Hezekiah had was a sickness unto death. It was something very, very, it was a terminal disease. Uh, in fact, as we read on, I believe it was cancer, as we'll see as we move on. But anyways, it says here in verse 2 and 3, Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. So here we see that Hezekiah is, re, is turning his face to, to the wall. He's pleading with God, and he's begging the Lord to spare his life. Then, further in the story, verse 4 and 5, Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. So we know that as Hezekiah turned his heart to the Lord in repentance, in confession, in pleading with God, God heard his prayer and he added to his years 15 years. And then in verse 21 at the end of the chapter, we read that Isaiah had said, let them take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon the boil, and he shall recover. So, you know, figs are just fruits. I mean, it's one of my favorite fruits that grows in the United States. Um, we have some figs in the Philippines, but it's very rare. I've only seen them once in all the years I've been over here. But we have seen them, and they're not as good as what we have in the U.S. But, but anyways... Imagine taking a lump of figs, taking this handful of figs and mashing it up into what we would call a poultice, or as the scripture says here, a plaster, and putting it upon somebody's tumor. Uh, in this case, where it's called a boil. So now this boil was so serious that it was life-threatening. I believe it was a tumor, probably cancer. But the point is, it was something that was terminal. It was very, very serious. It was life-threatening. And so they put this simple remedy, just a lump of figs on this boil, and he recovered. You can read the same story also in 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. It's in Isaiah 38 and also 2 Kings chapter 20. Interesting, in Isaiah 38, uh, in between the first part of the story and the last part where it tells about the remedy that God had instructed Isaiah to place upon uh, 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 Hezekiah uh, is Hezekiah's letter and description about death. He talks about death because he was very close to death. Okay, so let's read another story. And this is uh, a story about water treatment in the Old Testament, water treatment, which is what we call hydrotherapy. Uh, very interesting. So let's go to 2 Kings chapter 5. Now, if you have your Bible with you this morning, which I hope and pray you do, um, I would ask you to open with me to 2 Kings chapter 5, because we are going to read, um, I believe I put every verse in the chapter in the slides. I might have left a couple verses out. I can't remember. It's been a while since I put this together. It's been a few weeks. But um, 2 Kings chapter 5, we're going to start with verse 1. It says, now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable 
because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria? For he would recover him of his leprosy. You know, it's interesting. This, this little maid, this, this woman, was taken captive out of the land of Israel. And um, she became the, um, uh, the, the maid of Naaman's wife. And she was witnessing for the Lord by encouraging them to bring this man to the prophet of God and he would recover of his leprosy. So she was a medical missionary. She was witnessing for the Lord and encouraging this man, this great man, to go to the prophet of God for healing. In verse 4 to 6, we read this. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> Imagine how much gold they had in those days, no? And ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, now, when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, verse 7, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive? that this man doth sent unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. So the king of Israel was very suspicious, and he thought, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. I mean, you know, I'm not God. I cannot kill and make alive. I cannot heal this man of his leprosy. Maybe he has some evil intentions, no? And then in verse 8, and it was so, when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? In other words, why, why did you rip your clothes? No. Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Verse 8. Verse 9 and 10. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot, and stood at the door of the house of Elisha, and Elisha sent a messenger unto him. You know, it's interesting that here this Naaman, he's like this captain of, of the host of Syria. You know, he's like he's like the general in the army. He's a he's a big he's a big guy, you know. He has a very high position in his kingdom. And he comes with all the horses and his chariot and all these people, lots of soldiers, you know. And they come to the house of Elisha, and Elisha doesn't even go outside. He just sends a messenger and says, go and wash in Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth. In other words, he was angry. He was so angry. And he went away and said, behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and strike his hand over the place. And recover the leper. And then in verse 12 it says. He was complaining no? And he says. Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus. Better than all the waters of Israel. May I not wash in them and be clean. So he turned and went away in a rage. So imagine Naaman. He hears the message sent by Elisha. Just go and wash in the River Jordan seven times. He said, ah. Oh. He said, you know, <laughs> he says, why can't I just go and wash in these rivers? Why can't I do it my way? Why do I have to follow his instructions? And, of course, he was quite angry. And then in verse 13 it says, And his servants 
came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, to thee, wash and be clean. So, you know, he was expecting some great thing, some, some amazing, you know, treatment or miraculous uh, um, method of, of doing this, this miracle thing, you know, but it was a simple thing. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So here God sent a message through the prophet that he was to follow this simple, natural remedy. Does that sound familiar? And when he obeyed the instruction that God had spoken through the prophet, he was completely healed just by dipping in the river Jordan seven times. Pretty amazing. And the parallels are astounding. We'll talk about that as we move on. So we know that as we read the story, we're going to read the rest of the story. God's character is vindicated through this simple remedy. It says, and he returned to the man of God in verse 15, he and all his company and came and stood before him. And he said, behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. So it was through the simple remedy that God's character was vindicated. God's um, messenger was vindicated. And uh, so he offered Elisha a reward. In verse 16, we read, but he said, as the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So he was so thankful. He was so grateful. He was offering all of this gold and these clothing and all this stuff. But Elisha said, I will receive none. And Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. Then in verse 18. In this thing the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. So here we see that. Naaman was convicted of the, of the existence of the living God as a result of this miraculous healing that God had done through a very simple remedy that he was instructed to follow through the prophet of the Lord. Now, we're going to read the rest of the story because there's another lesson here in this story for us, and it's a lesson about Elisha's servant, Gehazi. And he said unto him, verse 19 and 20, go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master hath spared Naaman the Syrian in not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. So here we see Gehazi, he said, man, this is my golden opportunity. I can get some goodies as a result of this work of the prophet and this work that God had done, and I can enrich myself. And then in verse 22, it says, so Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, is all well? And he said, all is well. My master hath sent me, so now he's lying. He begins to lie, right? Because he's so covetous, he wants this reward, and so he lies about it. My master hath sent me, saying, Behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. That's in verse 22.
And Naaman said, be content. Take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants and they bear them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house. And he let the men go and they departed. Verse 24. And uh, then we read further. But he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said unto him, Whence camest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. Oh, I didn't go anywhere. <laughs> so he's lying to Elisha the prophet. And he said unto him, this is what Elisha responded. Went not mine heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and man ser maid servants? And then notice in verse 27, Elisha pronounced a curse upon this man. The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence, a leper white as snow. Wow. <laughs> what an amazing story. So here, you know, God did an amazing, amazing miracle in healing Naaman of leprosy, a living death. Through the prophet Elisha, the message was given to dip in the river Jordan seven times and, of course, he was expecting some great, you know, uh, method or some real complicated thing, you know, to happen. But it was a very simple remedy. And it was powerful. And God blessed that simple remedy. And he completely recovered. And so Gehazi, he took the opportunity to enrich himself and make lots of money, if you will, by this amazing thing that God had done. In order to secure this uh, wealth, he lied. And so when he came back to the prophet, he even lied to the prophet of God, and God cursed him, and he received the leprosy of Naaman, not only upon himself, but it says, and unto his seed forever. That means all his children would have leprosy. Wow. <laughs> so the Lord was very displeased with this man, wasn't he? So there's a lesson for us. You know, medical missionary work is the work of Jesus Christ. God wants his people in these last days to follow his example and to be medical missionaries in ministering to the sick. Now, the story is not saying that we should never charge people for our services uh, if we are ministering to their physical needs. But the point is, our motive in serving others should not be financial gain. I believe that's the moral of the story. And because I know some people, you know, even here in the Philippines, they charge an exorbitant amount of money for natural remedies or a cleansing program or an in-house you know, five or 10 day or two week program, they charge ex an exorbitant amount of money to people. And uh, I believe that they are committing the same sin as Gehazi. You know, the word medical missionary uh, re refers to two things. When we look at the word medical missionary, medical is in reference to the physical needs of those who are sick, right? And missionary identifies not only our purpose in ministering to their needs, but who we work for. We work for the living God. Our purpose in doing treatments to others or ministering to their physical needs is to bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ, their Savior. That's the purpose of medical missionary work. The purpose is not to set up a business and make money. Although, if we minister to their needs, and we are doing a service, we should charge a fair fee for our services. But my wife and I have, have pledged to the Lord that when we see people who are sick, who have no money, and there's quite a lot of people here in the Philippines that are sick, that have no money to pay for a program, 
we take them for free. We don't advertise that because some other people might take advantage and say, oh, I don't have any money, you know. <laughs> but the point is, um, it's missionary work. And I will share some testimonies uh, further on in this presentation. Um, but I wanted to show uh, to you this morning that our position as Seventh-day Adventists regarding medical missionary work is clearly substantiated in the scriptures, okay? And so I want to look today at another statement. This is from the pen of Ellen White. This is from the Spirit of Prophecy, taken from Last Day Events, page 80, or Medical Ministry, page 321. It says, as religious aggression subverts the liberties of our nation, those who would stand for freedom of conscience will be placed in unfavorable positions. For their own sake, they should, while they have opportunity, become intelligent in regard to disease, its causes, prevention, and cure. So there are a number of things that are mentioned. We should, be, we should become intelligent in regard to, number one, disease. We should know about different diseases. Number two, we should know about the causes of these diseases. And number three, we should know about how to prevent these diseases. There's the health message. God has given to us as a church a health message to proclaim to the world. And that health message, if obeyed, would prevent these diseases. Cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, autoimmune diseases, and etc. And we should study how to cure these diseases, we're told. And then the reason is plainly laid out before us. Notice, and those who do this will find a field of labor anywhere. There will be suffering ones, plenty of them, who will need help, not only among those of our own faith, but largely among those who know not the truth. Wow, very powerful statement. So we need to become intelligent in regard to disease, its causes, prevention, and cure. And God has given us resources in the spirit of prophecy, and there are other resources that are really good, such as the Natural Remedies Encyclopedia, a great book. Every Seventh-day Adventist should own that book. It's a great book. Um, it's published by Harvest Time Books, and it's a really good book that will give you a lot of information. All right, let's move on. This is taken from... Uh, Review and Herald, March the 6th, 1913. And this is a statement that will help us to understand the preparation that we must make in order to be medical missionaries. A lot of people think that if we are going to become a medical missionary, that we need to go to medical school or we need to be trained by medical doctors. But notice what it says here. It is not necessary that our medical missionaries follow the precise track marked out by medical men of the world. They do not need to administer drugs to the sick. They do not need to follow the drug medication in order to have influence in their work. You know, I have participated in more medical missions in the Philippines than I can count. And I can tell you that 90% of them, there were doctors who were only dispensing drug medications to those who came for help. While we were lecturing and teaching these people, but we have done other medical missions where with our team, because we have a team that works with us here in the Philippines, and we do medical missions, but there are no drug medications in our medical missions. We administer vitamins, minerals, and herbal medicines and natural remedies, and we educate those who come for help in how to reverse their disease process. So we do our medical missions totally different. I'm not condemning the medical doctors who do it their way, um, but we are instructed that we do not need to administer drugs to the sick and that we do not need to follow the drug medication in order to have influence in our work. Let's move on. A message was given me that if they would consecrate themselves to the Lord, 
if they would seek to obtain under men ordained of God a thorough knowledge of their work, the Lord would make them skillful. Some of our medical missionaries have supposed that a medical training, according to the plans of worldly schools, is essential to their success. To those who have thought that the only way to success is by being taught by worldly men and by pursuing a course that is sanctioned by worldly men, or shall we say accredited by worldly men, I would now say, put away such ideas. This is a mistake that should be corrected. It is a dangerous thing to catch the spirit of the world. The popularity which such a course invites will bring into the work a spirit which the word of God cannot sanction. Wow. <laughs> when I read this statement, you know, I've read, I've read most of, of and I'm, sa- I'm not saying this to boast, but I've read most of Ellen White's books over the years, and I've read pretty much everything she wrote on health, but I never read this statement. I, I may have read it, but I, I never remember reading this. And I read this a few months back, and I was astounded by this quotation. So, you know, because, um, you know, originally, uh, we as Seventh-day Adventists, uh, we were doing what is called medical missionary work in Loma Linda, as a matter of fact. And they were administering natural remedies, and they were healing the sick. And we know Kellogg uh, pioneered the hydrotherapy treatments, and and uh, he was doing an amazing work. And we had kings and queens and, and uh, famous people, presidents and prime ministers coming to our institutions, our sanitariums for healing. And they were being healed. And then later on, as apostasy crept into our ranks through the medical missionary work that was being done, uh, the leaders of the medical missionary work gravitated towards the worldly institutions and uh, they desired to be accredited by the U.S. government to receive their licenses to practice medicine from the U.S. government. This was a gradual process that took place. But over time, in order to receive their accreditation, they had to compromise These principles that we have already gone over thus far in our study this morning. And they would say, oh, we're going to do a charcoal poultice for this patient. And then uh, the ones who were in charge of the what LMI calls the medical fraternity, we call that the American Medical Association. They would say, oh, sorry, can't do that. That's not accredited. That's not an approved treatment. Uh, Okay, we'll... uh, We'll do hot and cold treatments. Oh, sorry. Water hydrotherapy is not an approved treatment. And so basically, they obliterated all the natural remedies because they're not FDA and AMA approved. And they were told that they could only give drug medications and do surgeries and chemotherapy. And otherwise, they would lose their license to practice medicine And eventually, if they continued, they would be put in jail. This is where we're at today. And this is how this all came about. It was a gradual downward process to total apostasy from what God had clearly instructed his church to do, as we have read in these statements. She says, it is a lack of faith in the power of God that leads our physicians to lean so much on the arm of the law and to trust so much to the influence of worldly powers. All right, let's read on. Whoop, let me go back. Hang on. All right. The true medical missionary will be wise in the treatment of the sick using the remedies that nature provides. And then he will look to Christ as the true healer of diseases. The principles of health reform brought into the life of the patient the use of nat- nature's remedies and the cooperation of divine agencies in behalf of the suffering will bring success. So I have a question. How will the patient who comes for treatment learn the principles of health reform? Of course, 
the doctors, the nurses, the medical missionaries were supposed to educate the patient what are the laws of health. And we've given been given plenty of instruction that they are to be educated step by step as to why they have high blood pressure, cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, etc. They are to be carefully instructed and lovingly encouraged through much prayer and, and education to change their diet and lifestyle and their exercise program and learn how to drink water and get sunshine and fresh air and so on. And, and then they would recover. Unfortunately, our institution started out as sanitariums that ministered natural remedies and God was doing miraculous things. People were being healed of terminal diseases through the simple agencies of nature. But after a time, as apostasy crept in and we compromised the principles of medical, true medical, true, what Elamite calls true medical missionary work, then our sanitariums became hospitals that only dispense drug medications, do surgeries, and give chemotherapy. Now, I'm not saying that hospitals are bad. I'm not saying that doctors are bad. We need hospitals and we need doctors because they are trained in emergency medical treatments that can save many lives. I have good friends who are surgeons and we need surgeons. Surgeons save lives. But what we are talking about is treating the diseases that afflict the human race. We're talking about um, now, there are some cases where cancer uh, is an advanced stage, and sometimes uh, surgery is necessary in order to, re to, to remove a life-threatening tumor, um, things like that, and that's in place. But the point is, what God is instructing us here is that we are to practice natural remedies in order to heal the sick, and that's not what I'm talking about. I mean, that's what we're talking about, but emergency medical treatment is necessary, all right. Medical missionary work. Remember, this is our work in these last days. This is what we're talking about. Medical missionary work. Medical missionary work is the pioneer work of the gospel. The door through which the truth for this time is to find entrance to many homes. God's people are to be genuine medical missionaries, for they are to learn to minister to the needs of both soul and body. The purest unselfishness is to be shown by our workers as with the knowledge and experience gained by practical work, they go out to give treatments to the sick. Notice that they go out. What does she mean by that? The next sentence, as they go from house to house, they will find access to many hearts. Many will be reached who otherwise never would have heard the gospel message a demonstration of the principles of health reform will do much toward removing prejudice against our evangelical work. Councils for the Church, page 308. Very powerful statement. God has instructed his people in the Bible, in Matthew chapter 10, in Luke chapter 9, that we are to go out house to house. Jesus sent his disciples to go house to house, two and two, to minister to the sick and to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And this is our work in these last days. And we are to go out and not only preach the gospel, but we are to give the treatments to the sick from house to house, and we are to demonstrate the benefits of the principles of health reform in our own lives and in teaching those who are sick and suffering that they can recover from diabetes, high blood pressure, rheumatoid arthritis, and all of these diseases by simply changing their diet to a plant-based diet and using the natural remedies that God has provided in nature, sunshine, drinking water, exercise, crucial. They must exercise if they are able. So let's move on. So let's talk about uh, what has happened in our world. And I've shared this slide before in, um, in your fellowship uh, years ago. I believe I shared this slide. Uh, we know that in 2000, from 2010 to 2018, approximately $300 billion were spent in the United States on pharmaceutical drugs or medications. The 
uh, most common drugs that were administered um, in hospitals and medical institutions were cholesterol lowering drugs, beta blockers, high blood pressure medications, diuretics, uh, analgesics for pain relief, cholesterol lowering drugs, et cetera. And, uh, and so this shows the drugs that were administered, most of them in 2007 and 2008. Here in the Philippines, uh, an article came out that shows that um, by the year 2020, the mm. Philippines pharma market was set to hit a record $4.1 billion by 2020. And of course, more and more people are getting sick and more and more people are being prescribed these drug medications. We know that drugs are very expensive, not only in the outlay of means, but in the effect produced upon the system, we're told. And this is a statement from the pen of inspiration. It says, as to drugs being used in our institutions, it's talking about Seventh-day Adventists, it is contrary to the light which the Lord has been pleased to give. The drugging business has done more harm to our world and killed more than it has helped or cured. The light was first given to me, Ellen White writes, why institutions should be established. That is, sanitariums were to reform the medical practices of physicians. This is taken from letter 69. 1898, taken from Medical Ministry, page 27. So why did God establish sanitariums among us in the early part of our work? It was to reform the medical practices of physicians. It was to educate away from drugs and to inculcate the natural remedies that were originally used in our institutions. But unfortunately, today... We as Seventh-day Adventists, we do not operate sanitariums. We operate medical centers and hospitals that only dispense drugs, drugs, and more drugs. And of course, we do surgeries. That saves life. I'm not against that. We need that. And there are only very few, very few institutions that are operated by Seventh-day Adventists, and I don't even know if the General Conference owns these institutions. I think they're individually owned. I don't know. But we know that Wildwood Lifestyle Center and Hospital and Classrooms is a center where people can go and do a lifestyle program and find natural remedies. We know that Yuchi Pines Lifestyle Center and Campus is also an institution run by Seventh-day Adventists. I don't know that it's run by the denomination or the General Conference. Perhaps it is individually owned or privately owned. I don't know because I've never been there and I don't know anybody that works there. But the point is we know that they do natural remedies in these institutions, but these are only two institutions. And of course, Weimar runs a lifestyle program as well that uses natural remedies. And these are the only three institutions that are run by Seventh-day Adventists that I know of that administer the natural remedies of nature and practice medical missionary work outlined in the Bible and spirit of prophecy. But the denomination, as I, as I don't know if they own those institutions, but nevertheless, uh, the denomination mostly runs a large hospital system that, by the way, uh, in the year 20 or 20, 2020 or 2021, received $21 billion from the U.S. federal government for their, for that's Advent Health, received $21 billion <clears throat> from the, uh, it may be million or billion, I can't remember which it is, but they received big money from the federal government and uh, uh, for Advent Health, uh, which includes our hospitals, including Loma Linda and our hospital system in Florida, Advent Health, uh, they receive funding from the U.S. federal government to the tune of millions and millions of dollars, big money. And of course, the federal government would never allow you to administer simple the simple agencies of nature in your institutions because that is not an approved treatment. All right, let's move on. 
volume two, select messages, page 289. And I'm looking at my clock. I've been speaking about 40 minutes. I think I have another 20 minutes. All right. Christ remedies cleanse the system. But Satan has tempted man to introduce into the system that which weakens the human machinery, clogging the dis- clogging and destroying the fine, beautiful arrangements of God. The drugs administered to the sick do not restore, but destroy. Drugs never cure. Instead, they place in the system seeds which bear a very bitter harvest. Now, I want to talk about this statement for just a moment, just in short. If you have high blood pressure and you are taking uh, high blood pressure medication um, and you decide one day, I'm not going to take these drugs anymore, what happens to your blood pressure when you stop taking your medication? Your blood pressure will go through the roof. You could have an aneurysm. You could have a stroke or a heart attack and die if you do that. If you do not cleanse the body through fasting, uh, detoxifying your your body, uh, changing your diet, uh, incorporating exercise. If you don't make changes in your body and in your lifestyle, then just by cutting out the medication alone, you could actually be committing suicide because you are your body needs those medications to keep your blood pressure at a safe level. And we know that those drugs only control the symptoms of an underlying illness, which is heart disease. So this is not what Ellen White is talking about. I mean, this is what she's talking about. She's saying that drugs do not cure disease. That high blood pressure medication didn't cure your high blood pressure disease or your heart disease. It only manipulated the symptoms of an underlying illness. And so I believe this is what Ellen White is talking about. But let's move on. We know that disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. In case of sickness, we are instructed, the cause should be ascertained. Unhelpful conditions should be changed. Wrong habits must be corrected. Then nature is to be assisted in her effort to expel impurities and to reestablish right conditions in the system. This is taken from Ministry of Healing, page 127. We know that cleansing is a biblical principle. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. We know that there are things that God has placed in nature, such as garlic. Uh, I don't espouse green tea uh, because it does have some elements that are not healthy for the body like caffeine. Uh, I don't use green tea, but I just showed this slide just for the purpose of showing us that there are things in nature such as uh, umpalaya, we call that bitter gourd, or umpalaya here in the Philippines. We have a lot of that. Spinach, mustard greens, avocado, different things that will help to cleanse the liver. And there are many herbs that can be used as well. This is a statement from the book Fasting and Eating for Health by Dr. Joel Furman, a book I highly recommend a really great book. Anyways, he says, while medical treatments aim at reducing the symptoms and may address some discrete areas of disease, they do little or nothing to remove the underlying illness or stop its progression to an untimely death. On the other hand, fasting treats the entire body. Now, this doctor discovered the benefits of fasting his patients, and he sees One miracle after another, as he fasts his cardiac patients, his diabetic patients, these are people with chronic degenerative diseases, Um, many of them scheduled for bypass surgery, angioplasty, stents, and things like that. Uh, These people have seen miraculous things take place as their disease process was reversed by simple fasting. Um, and he does he does longer term fasting, like one week, two weeks, things like that. Uh, I only recommend fasting as long as about one week at the most. Um, but we do juice fasting. And so let me show you a slide here. You click on the right place there. Um, there are five channels of elimination. And uh, I want to talk about that just for a moment as we wind up our study for this morning. 
In order for us to assist nature in her effort to expel impurities, as the spirit of prophecy says, we need to open up and increase the ability of these organs to detoxify or cleanse the body. These organs of, of elimination are the skin, the liver, the kidneys, the lungs, and the colon. So when we do a juice fast, and I don't recommend a long juice fast if you've never done that before, but I recommend drinking an eight ounce or 12 ounce glass of juice every hour while fasting. And I recommend a simple three day juice fast for those who are just beginning and learning how to fast. And of course you wanna break your fast with raw foods. This young man, as I wind up, I just wanna share a few testimonies. This young man is uh, one of my, my eldest son's uh, best friend in the Philippines. Um, of course, my eldest son is now living and residing in the United States, but they keep in touch. And uh, this young man had a stroke at the age of 26 years old. This was just a couple months ago that this picture was taken. Um, and after having his first stroke, his, his hand was like this, and he was dragging his foot. He had damage. This young man is 26 years old, only 26 years old. I got a call from my son. I talk to my kids quite often online. My son calls me up. He says, Dad, Adal, that's his name, Adal, that's his name. He says, Adal is having a stroke at his house. You need to quickly go there and, and rush him to the hospital. He's having a second stroke. I said, how do you know? He said, I was talking to him online and, and he says, he says, he says, bro, I'm having a stroke. I, I can't get up out of bed. Uh, I'm, I'm dying. So I jumped on my motorcycle with my youngest son who still lives with us. And uh, we quickly rode into town. We went to his house. And guess what herb I brought with me? Cayenne pepper. I found him lying in the bed. He said, oh, I have a lot of pain. I have pain. My, my, I have pain. And he could hardly move. I set him up in the bed and I said, open your mouth. And I put one drop of cayenne tincture, which was the liquid form of cayenne pepper, 180,000 heat units, one drop on his tongue. And he went, oh. I said, are you okay? He said, yeah. Uh huh. And I said, okay. So I went downstairs, I got a glass of water, I put just a little bit of water, I put two drops, I said, I'm gonna put two drops in there. He said, no, give me four. I put four drops of cayenne tincture in that little glass of water. I said, here, drink this. He drank it and within five minutes, the stroke was completely stopped in its track and his blood pressure began to drop it was still high. It was like 180 over 100 something. And it dropped down to like 150, 140. And we got his blood pressure to come down to a, a safer level. I told this brother, I said, brother, I says, what do you eat? That's the first thing I asked him. What do you eat every day? Meat, hamburgers, hot dogs, fried foods. This man eats no vegetables. He doesn't eat vegetables. He said, I don't like vegetables. I said, bro, you got to change your diet today, now. He said, I'm ready to start. I put him on a fruit fast of about, I think it was about four or five days. I said, no rice, because Filipinos eat rice pretty much with every meal. I said, no rice, no bread, nothing but fruit only for the next three or four days. And I said, then you're going to come to my lifestyle center in the Bukid, that means in the country, we have our place here in the country, which is where I'm at now. And um, you can probably hear the crickets. I think you can, you might be able to hear them. Anyways, they're singing. And so we brought him here. We put him on a 10 day cleanse. Before he went on the cleanse program, the damage in his hand and his dragging his foot was completely reversed just with a fruit fast of three to four days. During the cleanse, his blood pressure dropped down to a normal level. He was off all medication. And this young man is now skateboarding and running around and enjoying life. And he is eating vegetables and fruits as his diet now. 
I praise God for the miracle that he did in this young man's life. And while he was here, we gave him steps to Christ. I encourage him to give his heart to the Lord Jesus. I prayed with him every day. He called my son at the end of the 10-day program, and he was crying on the phone. He said, bro, he said, why are you crying? He says, I feel like I'm 16 years old. This is amazing. I feel so energized. I feel so good. It's a miracle. And he was so thankful to God. Wow. The simple agencies of nature, brothers and sisters, this is what God has called us to do. I want to show a video. Uh, this this man's name is Mario. Uh, we met him uh, going house to house. Uh, one of our Bible students in the barangay, in the little village here where we live, we go house to house every Sabbath with our little group. And we're doing Bible studies, and I'll show you a slide about that in just a minute. But we met this young man, this man, and uh, uh, through a friend, and uh, he had extreme pain from rheumatoid arthritis, and he could hardly even walk when I met this man. Let me show you the video. Okay, good afternoon. We're here with uh, Mario. Uh, he went through our 10-day uh, cleanse program. Actually, he was at our place for 12 days, and he had uh, extreme case of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, although... He's not completely recovered, but marami improvement and all. So that he put in the makiyad yung kamay. Taas, taas. Before he can't even lift his hands. Sa, ano ito ito? Sa, ito. Kaya ba? Oh, ano ito ba? Ano ito ba? Sige. Oh, now he can lift both his arms. At saka, kalakad na yun na. And I asked him, he used to walk too, right? He said, yeah, son. His wife. His wife had high blood pressure when they came to our center. She's following his diet, which is the vegan vegetarian Genesis 129 diet. And uh, I don't even know how to say it. I don't see 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 it. They're rich in health. Praise the Lord. So this is the update. Oh, it's very helping. So praise the Lord. Okay, so that's our update. Really exciting. To practice the laws of health, you will be blessed with health and strength and long life. And you'll be very happy. Praise the Lord. So that's my call. Okay, so um, this man, when he came to us, like I said, he could barely walk. He spent 12 days going through our program. In those 12 days, he could he there was a whole week that he couldn't even get out of bed. He was in excruciating pain. We mashed up a bunch of uh, cabbage and we put it on there. We wrapped it and we put it on both his knees, which were extremely swollen from all that uric acid and everything and the inflammation there. And uh, we did charcoal poultices. We did hydrotherapy. We did steam bath. We did... Uh, colonic treatments, we did uh, coffee enemas, we did praying and encouraging. And, you know, we're told that physical healing is bound up with the gospel commission. And this man today is now walking around. Here he is eating his raw food after four days of fasting. This man is walking around and he's almost completely, almost completely healed of rheumatoid arthritis and his wife no longer takes her high blood pressure medication because they are both vegan vegetarians and they exercise and they drink water and they have sunshine and fresh air and they trust in God. And today my wife and the other ladies went and gave them a Bible study while I was doing Bible studies with some other people in the barangay where we live. Here's a picture of some of the ladies that uh, I had been sharing with on a regular basis, and uh, the young man. And uh, today, 
uh, several of these ladies were in the Bible study and several other ladies had attended our Bible study for the first time. And uh, one of the ladies is this young lady here with her little child. She's 21 years old and her heart got open to the truth. And she's been taking Bible studies from us as well. Every Sabbath, we have Bible studies at 3 p.m. Uh, recently, we did a 10-day cleanse program as I'm winding up. Just a couple more minutes, and I'll close my uh, presentation. Um, we did a, a cleanse program with some Adventist brothers and sisters. Uh, some of them came from, from the United States to the Philippines to visit their relatives. Uh, the man on the right in the forefront is Pastor Ponch. He's a retired Seventh-day Adventist minister, a very godly and very humble man of God. And his wife, the lady in the forefront to the left, Sister Elma, and her sister behind her, uh, Sister Marlene, and her husband on the right, Brother Bing. Uh, Brother Bing had taken a recent mandated treatment, and I won't mention what that is, but you can guess. And as a result of that mandated treatment, uh, he was very weak, and he could hardly, he was having trouble breathing, his energy was gone, and um, uh, so he was really having a hard time. He came to the Philippines for treatment. Uh, he went through our 10-day program, and during the 10-day cleanse, his energy came back. He was able to run a chainsaw, a weed eater. He said, this is amazing. This is amazing. He said, I feel so good. And he got off his high blood pressure, medic most of his high blood pressure medications, and he's doing really well, and they are back in the United States. And they have a really beautiful place up in the country. Look at the view. Isn't that amazing? This is uh, breaking their fast. And here's another picture. Uh, they're eating a fruit salad after four days of juice fasting. That's what we feed our patients, uh, our guests, our visitors. Uh, of course, we did the program in their country property. And uh, they are going to be setting up a lifestyle center there. And they're going to be doing programs. So we're going to assist them with that. And so now we have a working relationship with this loving couple and these uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, Seventh-day Adventists, praise the Lord. Here's Sister Marlene in the steam bath. She's getting cooked there. <laughs> and uh, they were really amazed by the results of the cleanse. And they gave some really powerful testimonies afterward. I can't share that with you because it's all in Tagalog mostly. Uh, but I will be posting it on my YouTube channel later uh, for those in the Philippines. We are in the process right now, as I speak, of doing a cleanse, a 10-day cleanse program with these people here, uh, these four people in the forefront, uh, the two ladies in the back. One of them is my wife, Daryl. You recognize her. And the lady next to her is Ellen, uh, one of our team members who helps us during cleanse programs, and she works with us. She's also a medical missionary. Here we are in our Bukid, our country property at our lifestyle center. These people... Um, are pictured here breaking their four-day juice fast. And we have seen gallstones come out. We have seen uh, high blood pressure reduced. And uh, this lady in the on the right in the front is getting off her high blood pressure medication. And God is doing amazing things with these people. We are on day seven, day seven or eight now. And they're on, uh, 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 today is, today being Sunday here in the Philippines, is going to be their second four-day juice fast, and they're doing really well. And uh, they're going to be going home on Monday. We feed them fruits when they break their fast. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that beautiful? This is what they eat after a four-day juice fast. Look at that raw food. This is a raw soup and raw spaghetti made from shredded, uh, like it's a, like a shredded vegetables and a salad. Uh, that's not cheese. It looks like Parmesan cheese. That shredded coconut with some spices on there, uh, herbal spices like garlic and onion and stuff like that, and a raw soup that my wife warms up, and it's really amazing. This is the food that the patients will eat after a four-day juice fast. All right, uh, let me close our presentation. Um, I'm going to skip this for the sake of time. Wait, wait, let me back up. I don't want to leave this. Let me see. Let me go here. All right. Um, let me see this. Okay, I'll go ahead and read this. This will only take me about 30 seconds, maybe a minute. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. 
There is need of coming close to the people by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. The poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and the bereaved comforted, the ignorant instructed, the inexperienced counseled. We are to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice, accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God. This work will not, cannot be without fruit. Ministry of Healing, page 143. So this is the message for us this morning. I'll just put our contact information up here. If you would like to see more of our videos and our mission updates, you can go to our YouTube channel. Restoration to Eden Ministry is the name of our YouTube channel. YouTube channel. Restoration to Eden Ministry. And our email is steps to Eden at yahoo.com. Uh, for those who may be watching here in the Philippines, our cell phone numbers are listed there. And for international uh, viewers, uh, you can message us on Facebook, James Kirtley and my wife, Daryl Kirtley. So this concludes our first presentation. And may God bless the preaching and the speaking of his word is my prayer. Happy Sabbath. Amen.